Tonight, the deadly airstrike in a refugee camp in Gaza as Israeli troops escalate their offensive on the ground. The massive destruction at Gaza's largest refugee camp, apartment buildings leveled, dozens killed, according to hospital officials. Israel saying the strike killed a senior Hamas commander. The military pushing farther into Gaza, hitting more than 300 targets in 24 hours. Our Richard Engel standing by. Also, the stark warning the FBI chief telling Congress the Hamas attacks could inspire the biggest terror threat to the U.S. since ISIS. At another hearing, anti-war protesters, their hands painted red, removed by police amid threats to Jewish students at Cornell, the suspect now in custody. The search and arrest warrants just unsealed for the gunman in the main mass shooting. The new details we're learning. The record-breaking cold this Halloween across the country. Bursts of false snow, the danger on the roads. We're tracking it. Newly revealed body cam from the deadly Maui wildfire, what it shows. The dramatic rescue after a plane crashes into the Everglades. And our NBC News exclusive, the creators of Friends, speaking out. The last conversation one of them had with Matthew Perry before his tragic death. This is NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Good evening and welcome. Israel's push into the heart of embattled northern Gaza is not coming without a deadly cost. And the images of suffering are no easier to take tonight. A Hamas-run hospital says dozens are dead and hundreds injured in an Israeli airstrike on a Palestinian refugee camp. Though NBC News cannot independently confirm those numbers. Israel not denying its forces hit the camp, calling it a known Hamas stronghold and saying its strike killed a top Hamas commander involved in planning the October 7th terror attacks on Israel. Fierce battles are underway in northern Gaza tonight, Israel rejecting calls for a ceasefire. Determined to crush Hamas over the surprise attack that left 1,400 Israelis and foreigners dead and others taken hostage. Richard Engel remains at the Israel-Gaza border and leads our coverage tonight. Israel devastated part of a refugee camp on the edge of Gaza City, carrying out what it called a large-scale strike in one of the most densely populated areas in the world. A nearby Hamas-run hospital tonight said dozens were killed and hundreds injured. NBC News cannot independently confirm those figures. The camp is full of apartment buildings, and people can be seen carrying away wounded and dead and digging through rubble. Israel said it was targeting one of the leaders of Hamas's October 7th massacre of 1,400 Israelis and that its strike collapsed a subterranean structure. Israel blamed Hamas for the civilian deaths, saying Hamas uses civilians as human shields. Perhaps the only thing not in dispute in this war is that civilians in Gaza are suffering and that the hospitals needed to care for the growing number of injured are barely functioning. This has been a, a massacre that's been unfolding, and now we're getting to the final chapter of this massacre where even the wounded will not be spared. The world needs to intervene now. UNICEF today calling Gaza a graveyard for thousands of children. Israel has rejected a ceasefire, saying it would be a surrender to Hamas. Everything we're seeing here in southern Israel indicates that this ground offensive is still ramping up with more and more troops heading into Gaza. In. Israel says it struck 300 Hamas targets today and that it's hunting Hamas commanders. It claims this strike killed an architect of the mass murder of Israelis in two kibbutzes near Gaza. As Israel increased its estimate once again of the hostages held in Gaza, now to 240. <laughs> One is back with her family, Private Ori Magidish, rescued by Israeli troops. While Natalie Ranan, an American teenager taken hostage by Hamas, is also back home in the Chicago area. She was freed 11 days ago. And Richard, as you know, there's a lot in play here tonight. Another Iranian-backed militia is again sparking fears of a regional conflict. So two U.S. military officials tell NBC News they believe that Houthi rebels in Yemen fired a ballistic missile at Israel. Israel shot it down. So the United States is already in a low-level conflict with these Iranian-backed militias. The question is how big it will get. Lester. All right, Richard Engel, thank you. And here at home, the head of the FBI issued a strong new warning today about an increased terrorist threat in this country 
from potential attackers who might be inspired by Hamas. Garrett Hake has that story. Please stand and raise On Capitol Hill tonight, a stark warning about the growing threat at home from the devastating war abroad. The ongoing war in the Middle East has raised the threat of an attack against Americans in the United States to a whole nother level. FBI Director Chris Wray signaling the U.S. is in a dangerous period. We assess that the actions of Hamas and its allies will serve as an inspiration, the likes of which we haven't seen since ISIS. As Jewish college students are facing threats on U.S. campuses, Cornell University officials today confirming the arrest of a suspect in connection with online threats of a mass shooting and other violence there. To see, you know, my own campus targeting specifically 104 West, this building, the building that I live in, sleep in, it was just unbelievable. A Las Vegas man also charged with threatening to kill Nevada Senator Jackie Rosen, who is Jewish, after leaving a series of anti-Semitic, profanity-laced voicemails. 3,500 kids dead. Also on the Hill, anti-war protesters interrupting a hearing as the secretaries of state and defense were pushing the White House plan to spend $105 billion in emergency support for Israel, Ukraine, and other national security threats. That funding dividing House and Senate Republicans. New Speaker Mike Johnson setting a vote this week on aid to Israel alone, with $14 billion in military and humanitarian assistance, while some GOP senators argue to include aid to Ukraine. To separate the package is, is naive because the threats are in, have commonality. Garrett, what more did the FBI director have to say about the threats here? Well, Lester, he said that the Bureau is not tracking any imminent threat from a foreign terrorist group and that his biggest concern is violent extremists who may be inspired by the events taking place in the Middle East. Ray urged all Americans to continue to be vigilant. Lester. All right, Garrett, thank you. And the effort underway to get American and other foreign nationals out of Gaza is becoming more urgent by the day. But it's uncertain tonight when the vital Rafah border crossing from Gaza to Egypt will be open to more than just humanitarian aid trucks. Megan Fitzgerald is there. Tonight, our first-hand look at the Rafah border crossing, a lifeline for millions of people suffering and trapped inside Gaza. In the last 10 days, more than 200 aid trucks have passed through here, 66 just today. But the UN says it's not nearly enough. The situation in Gaza has become absolutely inhumane. A UNICEF employee sending this voice message to NBC News from inside Gaza, saying the crisis is taking a personal toll on her own daughters. And I have the youngest, she's four years old, and she's showing severe symptoms of stress and fear and resorts to self-harm, like ripping her hair off and scratching her thighs until they bleed. UNICEF warning a lack of clean water is putting lives of Gaza's one million children at risk of dehydration. The plan was for the Rafa border crossing to alleviate this crisis. The Rafa border is supposed to be a two-way crossing with these trucks packed with aid making their way in. Americans and foreign nationals that are trapped just beyond this border making their way out that hasn't happened yet. Egypt is not accepting Palestinian refugees, and foreign nationals say they have not been allowed out. Nearly a thousand Americans are trapped inside Gaza, and the U.S. says Hamas is blocking them. The impediment uh, is simple it's Hamas. We pressed Egypt's head of state information. Who's holding up the Americans from crossing over the border? The Americans? Is, is Hamas. America says Hamas is holding up the Americans. Us, 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 us. Meanwhile, Americans like Qasim Ali are running out of patience. We don't see any care for us from the American government. I don't know why. Americans caught in the crossfire, desperate to escape. Megan Fitzgerald, NBC News, Rafa border crossing, Egypt. Tonight, we are learning much more about concerns raised by family and even members of the military long before an Army reservist killed 18 people in Maine. Emily Aketa reports now from Lewiston, Maine. Tonight, new details on apparent warning signs about the suspect months before the mass shooting. According to records from the county sheriff, Robert Card's son and ex-wife contacted them on May 3rd, saying they were concerned about his access to firearms because he was hearing voices or starting to experience paranoia. A deputy reached out to Card's Army Reserve Unit, who said they would figure out options to get Robert help. 
In July, he spent two weeks in a psychiatric facility. Then in September, the Army Reserve asked for a wellness check on Card after he threatened to shoot up their facility. A sergeant was so concerned, he said he thought Card could snap and commit a mass shooting. A sheriff's deputy went to Card's home twice but was unable to make contact. A statewide attempt to locate alert was issued. That statewide alert was lifted one week before 18 people were killed. They attempted to do two wellness checks but never actually connected with him. Should there have been more? Oh gosh, follow up until it's done. They, he wanted to kill somebody. Among the victims, Jim Lapowitz's son-in-law, Josh Seal. This weekend I was blowing the leaves uh, on my yard and many times I just stop and break down because this could have been prevented. The Army says they determined Card should not have a weapon or handle ammunition, while records from the Sheriff's Office show Card's family said they would work to secure his personal guns. At least three guns have been recovered as part of the investigation, all obtained by Card legally. Maine's governor called for action on Monday, but wouldn't say whether law enforcement's response was adequate. We want to get at the, at the best answer to how can we prevent something like this from happening, and that includes why did it happen in the first place. Newly released court documents reveal Card's sister identified him to police the night of the shooting and that family told investigators he'd been struggling since a bad breakup earlier in the year with someone he originally met at a cornhole competition at the bar where the shooting occurred. Lester. Emily Akata, thank you. If your family is trick-or-treating tonight, be aware we could be in for one of the coldest Halloweens on record. 77 million are under frost and freeze alerts from Texas to New York. Some cities like Chicago seeing their first snow of the season. And south of Minneapolis, multiple crashes reported in slippery conditions. In Maui, police have released harrowing previously unseen body cam video showing the response to the Lahaina wildfire that killed some 100 people. Miguel Almaguer has the footage. We have to warn you, some of it may be difficult to watch. Jesus. You gotta go! The heart pounding video captures the scramble to escape the flames and the race to He's save right. lives. Come out, come out, come out. As wildfires tore through Lahaina, Maui police rescued 15 people trapped inside a coffee shop on famed Front Street, while come, thick come, come, smoke come choked the air and the inferno closed in. Come on, come on, come on. Everybody out, everybody out, everybody out. Everybody the harrowing out, scene out. unfolding August 8th. This our first perspective from police who selected the 16 minutes of video from 20 hours of footage. To say that the Maui Police Department did not do their due diligence to save lives is false. Get the f*** out of the way! First facing flames at 6 in the morning. There's a fire. Is there anybody else in here? Police scrambled to break open locked gates on dirt roads to create escape routes and rushed to evacuate residents. This is not f***ing important! We're trying to f***ing get everybody out of custody! As the blaze erupted through the night, one officer loads a burn victim into his car, realizing he's badly in need of help. I'll just take you straight to the hospital. With 99 believed dead and 2,000 structures destroyed, we have five minutes to get out of here. These 16 minutes of hell are for many a lifetime of pain. Authorities in Maui still have not named a cause for the fire as downed power lines remain a focus of the investigation. Lester. Miguel, thank you. And a dramatic scene today in a remote part of the Florida Everglades where a small plane crash in the middle of the night. More than seven hours later, rescuers arrived and hoisted the pilot onto a helicopter. He was taken to a hospital with a leg injury. The cause of the crash is being investigated. In 60 seconds, a seat at the table. We speak to families in one city about why what's happening in the Middle East is striking such a painful chord with so many American families. It is a place here in America both Jews and Palestinians call home, the twin cities of Minnesota, where they are following all this in this war intensely. Gabe Gutierrez spent the day getting their views on the conflict. More than 6,000 miles from Israel, the war hits home. So my initial response was fear and sadness mm -hmm. and anger. A seat at the table, it's both also, Jewish. Just living a nightmare, like a horror story. Palestinian, we are Semitic people. And Palestinian. Jeff Burstein's grandfather opened his family's first Jewish restaurant in the 1930s. He now checks the latest news from Israel hourly and was horrified when he first learned of Hamas's terrorist attack on October 7th. Were you surprised? 
No. Why not? Because they've been telling for years that they want to destroy not only Israel, but Jews. And people that speak that way, you have to believe what they tell you. Over lunch, we listened in as three Jewish Americans opened up about their agony over the war. My extended Jewish family is being threatened here yeah. on a daily basis and across the world, and it's terrifying and infuriating. I feel like I, I just keep going back to the word home, and it's not home like a home that's thousands of, thousands of miles away. It's home that is like right here. I think there's a way to have discourse that isn't hateful. There's exactly. a way to have a protest that doesn't say yes. kill the Jews. And as for the humanitarian concerns in Gaza. I'm getting very emotional because I really wish there was a way to, you know, be able to still feed people, but have it not also feed the enemy who came in and slaughtered thousands of our own people. Nearby Mims Cafe opened decades ago. Palestinian-American owner Mahmoud Shaheen's wife and five of his children live in the occupied West Bank. When you see the images coming out of Gaza, of all those casualties, what it goes through your head? You know, it is horrifying. It is definitely horrifying. We also listened in as Palestinian Americans at his restaurant spoke about the war from a much different perspective. It does seem clear that Israel is, is geared towards vengeance, not necessarily giving the leadership of Hamas by itself. Until there's an end to Israeli occupation and aggression, there will be no peace. They're furious at the U.S. government for not supporting a ceasefire. I am honestly not voting uh, Democrat again. Um, I'm not going to vote for Biden. But for them, this is about much more, what they consider a long history of being dehumanized. This idea that we have to constantly earn empathy is ridiculous. We're auditioning for sympathy. It's outrageous. Two tables, two very different viewpoints, a world apart. Gabe Gutierrez, NBC News, Minneapolis. We'll take a short break. Coming up with mortgage rates and home prices soaring, how to navigate this tough real estate market. Our series, Price Out, is next. As mortgage rates soar and with home prices near record highs, what can you do if you're looking for a home in this difficult market? CNBC's Diana Olick has some answers in our series, Priced Out. Marta Moreno is on the hunt for a bigger home. That's really cool. But today's sky-high mortgage rates are giving her a big pause. I'm guessing you probably have a very low mortgage rate on your current mortgage, yes? Yes. Everybody's got 3%, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so it makes it really difficult to, you know, uh, to purchase a home at a much higher interest rate. In just two years, mortgage rates have gone from 3% to 8%. That adds nearly $1,000 to the monthly payment on today's median priced home. Rates are surging because the Federal Reserve is still trying to tame inflation, and the economy is still hotter than they'd like. We don't know exactly when it's going to be over, but we do hear a chorus of Fed speakers in a very notable way saying that they are restrictive and that they can wait and see what happens with the policy filtering through to the economy. High rates are colliding with record low supply of homes for sale, which real estate agents say is freezing the market well before winter hits. I think people are anxious and there's a lot of like buyer mentality of we're going to wait and see. If you are one of those buyers, you probably want to get pre-approved for a mortgage at a high rate just in case. See if you can pool cash, maybe borrow from family to be more competitive. And be ready to move fast if and when rates drop. So for buyers today, it's a tough call. You can either get in now at a high rate and maybe get a deal on the price or wait for rates to drop, but then potentially get caught in a wave of competition and end up in a bidding war. Lester. All right, Diana Olick, thanks. Up next, remembering Matthew Perry, Hoda Kotb speaks exclusively with the co-creators of Friends. What he said in their final conversation. Next. Finally, our NBC News exclusive. As fans are still reeling from the death of Matthew Perry, the co-creators of Friends, Marta Kaufman and David Crane, are speaking out to our Hoda Kotb. Kaufman told Hoda about the last time she spoke with Perry shortly before his untimely death. I know you just spoke to Matthew two weeks ago. Will you just tell me what that conversation was like? It was great. He was happy and and chipper. He didn't seem weighed down. 
by anything. He was in a really good place, which is why this seems so unfair. You can catch more of their emotional interview tomorrow morning on Today. That's Nightly News. Thank you for watching, everyone. I'm Lester Holt. Please take care of yourself and each other. Good night. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.